Hello and welcome to Off The Shelf Reviews. I found this in my boiler. And I'm Gary. And today we're going to review and discuss A Nightmare on Elm Street Part 2, Freddy's Revenge, which released in 1985. Written by David Chaskin and directed by Jack Shoulder. Ian, why don't you give us the synopsis? Well, five years after Nancy and her friends were taken out by Freddy, we follow Jesse Walsh, played by Mark Patton, and his family who have moved into Nancy's home. The horror of Freddy has been lost, but he's starting to snake his way back into the world and hopes to use Jesse's body to capture more children. So we all know the story that New Line Cinema was the house that Freddy built. Yes. And after the huge success that was A Nightmare on Elm Street, Robert Shea was adamant that we were going to be making A Nightmare on Elm Street Part 2. <laughs> needed that money to keep the studio. Now it's got some money. It can spend some, but it needs it needs that solid foundation. Yeah. And Wes Craven was, you know, he was adamant that it was going to be a happy ending to Nightmare on Elm Street 1. <laughs> no, no Freddy all of a sudden coming back for one last scare, which was... Robert Shea's idea yeah. they made it happen. Not necessarily, he thought, to make it make sequels, which, yeah. of course, he did want. Yeah. Uh, but Wes Craven was also like, I don't see this being a franchise. I don't see this being a series of movies, so I'm out. And Robert Shea was like, well, we w I want this next film to be released within the year yep. of the first one coming out, to wow. capitalize on yeah. it. And so Nightmare on Elm Street 2 was a huge, huge rush uh, there are certain people that were involved in the first film coming back to work on the second one, but they quit. Yeah. There was one of the set designers, I believe, was just like, look, things are being so rushed. The budget's not there. People don't know what they're doing. I'm leaving. Yeah. Um, they didn't ask uh, Heather Lenkenkamp yeah. to come back to play Nancy. They were like, oh, we're going to do a whole new story, whole new idea. Yeah. So yeah. We, don't, we don't need her. Uh, we don't need Robert Englund. We're gonna hire this this stunt man. Just put him. Just put him in the makeup. Like we doesn't we, it doesn't matter. And just a couple of weeks into production, they were like, "Wait a minute, this Freddy Krueger thing's not working out." Yeah, I think we best get Robert Englund back on the phone. And apparently, it was Robert Englund's agent that was just like, "Look, Robert Englund defined that character. He yeah. made it his own. Yeah, if you want him." You're gonna have to you have to pay for him. Yeah, pay for him. <laughs> but that was just a, just a couple of the things that that mired this film's production to begin with. Let alone the fact, looking back at this film now, it's usually the one that people have a problem with. Yeah, I I don't see that. I have no idea why people have that problem. Nightmare on Elm Street Part Two was my first foray into the world of Freddy Krueger. I saw it really, really young, at an age where children should never be watching horror movies, and it 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 absolutely blew me away because I like I didn't know his story. I didn't know what had happened in the first movie. You know, I didn't understand the background behind Nancy. I didn't even know Wes Craven at that point, and and the whole foray of movies that he had done. So all I knew was that there was this guy with this killer claw and a scary face, and right off the bat, like. When you're a child, I, I I grew up in the 80s watching 80s movies thinking, wow, I never want to go to American high schools because <laughs> it's the most fucking terrifying thing ever. And like this, this opening cements that, you know, you, you have the, the music gently lulling you in. You have the bus, you have the children on the bus. They're all being taken and dropped off at their usual bus stops at the end of the day. And you see Mark Patton there, Jesse Walsh. Um, you know, he, he looks completely different in this sequence than he does in the rest of the film. You know, this is really just like a, a, a geeky representation of, of him. And you have these two girls who are kind of giggling and laughing and seeing that he's there. And if, you, if you're looking very closely as well, you will spot Robert Englund driving this bus. <laughs> right. Right at the start. Now... Like, watching back at the series, you're like, oh, that's clearly Freddy Krueger. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah. we know, but, I mean, if you didn't know, it is just a bus driver, but it is also just a nice cameo to have Robert yes. England in a nightmare movie without the makeup on. Well, yeah, because you, you never get to see him without the makeup on unless it's one of the later movies. But you, you notice something is wrong once the bus doesn't stop 
at a particular stop and then all of a sudden it just rushes out into the desert and i've always loved this whole opening sequence because the the, the the sky changes from day to night really quickly the landscape becomes like really hellish really I quickly do, i do agree but it is clearly shot during the day and just contrasted oh. day for night and i'm just like oh dude dude when you're eight years fucking old you don't care you're like oh my god yeah, I know, but it like I love this opening sequence too. It is one of my favorite openings to the, the entire franchise. I think they nailed the atmosphere yes. here. Uh, the, the moment when the bus stops and the ground starts to give way, yeah, uh, everyone's panicking. I was like, this is really, really tense. It's the way that the the uh, the bus kind of growls as well, like an animal as it's gr going along, and you're seeing like little hand. You see Freddy's hand changing the gears and stuff like that, and then it's just balancing on these rocks over hell i always assume this is hell is this way he's taking yeah. the children you know and he's, he's he's wanting to scare the children as much as he can to get the real fear out of them like i've i've always wondered this is this jesse's dream and freddie's torturing him or is this the girl is this the dream of the two girls and freddie is about to kill those two girls and and jesse just happens to be in the dream because when he wakes up you know freddie kind of kills the two girls and jesse wakes up absolutely terrified we don't actually find out at all how long they've been in that house it only seems like maybe a couple of weeks because he hasn't unpacked oh, i was gonna say yeah it's not he's not been there very long at all no but it has been five years since the events of the first film since the end of the first film so so everything's been forgotten people are People barely know the rumours of what happens. You know, some people know that this girl saw her boyfriend die across the road. Can't believe you bought the well, house. Well, yeah, he, he ends up having a kind of a friendship. It's not an immediate friendship with this guy called Grady. Yes, Robert Rustler. Like, yes, yep. Yeah. And, you know, they have this moment out on the field where he ends up with his pants being pulled down after he <laughs> got hit in the head with a ball. Yeah. Uh, and then the two of them end up doing press-ups together because the coach has had a go at them. <laughs> yeah. The coach... Played by Marshall Bell, yes. who pops up here, there, and everywhere. <laughs> yeah, he does. <laughs> uh, he, uh, and so that's when they're in the locker room and he starts talking to them like, Hey, you moved into that house hall. The girl there went crazy. Saw her boyfriend across the street get murdered. Horrible, yeah. horrible stuff. Uh, but anyway, I just want to rewind back just a little bit. Uh, back to the, uh, the opening dream sequence. Yeah, yeah. One of the first things you notice when watching this film, if you're a fan of the, the Nightmare on Elm Street series... There's a, a film, the film score to Nightmare on Elm Street, yes. which is used in the entire series, is not used in this film one bit. No. There's, no, there's no, you know, remixing of it or reimagining of it. It's just not used. And for me, not having the nightmare theme makes this film not feel like a nightmare movie because it doesn't have its music. Now, they did get in what I would consider a fantastic horror composer, yes. which is Christopher Young, yeah. who did the music for Hellraiser and Hellraiser 2. Great, great music. But even though the music in this film, sometimes it's serviceable and sometimes it's good, um, it doesn't feel like Freddy Krueger. Yeah. Uh, but I will also say the ending of that first dream sequence, the nightmare when he wakes up, is one of the most comical moments for me in the entire franchise. Because it cuts to the family in the <laughs> kitchen, eating cereal out of the Fu Manchu box. Yeah. The dad with the newspaper, the <laughs> mum pottering around, and Jesse scream. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Mommy, why can't Jesse wake up like everybody else? It is so it is so comical. Like it the film for me sets you up like having this horrible nightmare sequence right into comedy. Yeah. I was like, I don't know if it was intentional, but that is the way it plays. See, I I I I don't think it was intentional, but as we said, with with a rush production, you know, people not really doing or knowing what the hell that they're doing, you're literally just throwing these moments together and hoping that something will stick. I mean, uh, Clue uh, Gulliger playing uh, the dad, Ken Walsh, like awesome, iconic <laughs> character. Yeah, I, I I was researching it, and he took a couple of injuries on this set. Yeah, you know, from like an exploding parakeet at one point, <laughs> that and exploding parakeet scene, like. That's the thing this film does is like is is weird stuff happening in reality outside of the dreams. See, yeah, yeah. Well, I'll get to the bird bit. It's like <laughs> I, I I got some explanation for why some of these things happen. But I also love the fact that Clue 
must have just had the easiest time because a lot of the time he's just sat down. Yeah. He doesn't do any running around or attacking or well, anything. There is a scene later where he's up a ladder trying to undo and take away all he, of the bars. He's just on a ladder, dude. <laughs> it's not like he's leaping from the ladder. He's just stood on it. He sat in the room. He sat in the front room at one point, just kind of fanning himself. It doesn't so matter hot. what this man's doing. No, he's awesome. He's, he's awesome. I loved the. I loved as well. We had um, we had Hope Lange uh, playing the mum. And uh, I've read in uh, um, some notes that uh, Mark Patton mentioned that she was drinking a lot on set. And at one point, uh, while they were waiting to do makeup, she got uh, Mark Patton drunk. And when the costume designer came in, she reported them both because they were obviously too intoxicated <laughs> to do anything. I was like, oh my God, you got this real... Like, I, I look at... Uh, while I was watching the movie for this review, I'm looking at the mum. I'm like, is she drunk? <laughs> like, yeah... <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it it does set up the fact that Jesse is your main guy. He is the male scream queen throughout this whole movie. And I've got to give him a hand. Like, I know a lot of people don't think that this movie does very well. But I think he really makes it stand out as the only male lead in a, in a Nightmare on Elm Street movie. Every other movie after this and before... Just has the female lead. That is the formula. Now, the thing is, he... Mike Patton has also said of the role that it's definitely a female part. And that Lisa is the male part. But he embraced that. He was like, it's totally fine. Yeah, well, there, there are... Obviously, there's, you know, uh, uh, fans of the film that le years later would talk about the homoerotic tones. You know, and this kind of the, the hidden messages, I suppose, that people think or supposedly are there that I sometimes don't see but then Mark Patton years later would come out as gay so I don't know if it's actually him acting as that character and letting some of these well, hints through that people were then picking up that weren't there intentionally but they just they happened. were they were there was a lot of stuff that was there intentionally now yeah Mike Patton is an openly gay actor mm. and he said he played Jesse like a closeted gay man which Freddie is able to feed upon and toy with him. And so... Yeah. So having the gay actor playing this part like a closeted gay man is very interesting. It's a very interesting take because no no horror movies would really explore this. Well, that's but what... It, yeah. I just want to also bring up that the set designer was also a gay person. Right, right. And so there's lots of little uh, little things hidden in, in the environment. Oh, right. Like, there's a board game called Probe. <laughs> right? I mean, the, the sign on his door says, No chicks allowed. <laughs> you know? Yeah. There's there, there's the scene where he has his pants pulled down. There now there is this scene. Now the the actor has also said that this scene played in gay bars and, and nightclubs for years and years to come, and that is him dancing <laughs> in his room. When he squares up to his dresser drawer and bottoms it closed. When he's singing and dancing and throwing himself around, now it was supposed to be an homage to Risky Business. Yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna, I was gonna say, but it, 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 it can come across, and then you're just gonna pile on the different ideas, the different rumors from different people, and before you know it, it's taken on an idea of itself. I just want to say as well, the director said when even years after this film came out, he had no idea there was any no. gay undertones, overtones, or in your face innuendo. It's, it's like <laughs> when people say the same thing to me about Top Gun. I don't yes. see those things in Top Gun. It's it's a war movie where a bunch of guys are kind of being buddies. You know, people can point out what they think they see, but I may not see it. Same thing with this movie. I saw it at a young age and I'm like, he's just dancing in his room. It's cool. But as an as, as I'm older now, like you just said, the idea that this gay actor who during the 80s was probably hiding his... Well, homosexuality. I mean, at the point in the film coming out, like AIDS, it's just been like yeah. this huge thing. So there was still this whole fear and stigma about it as well. So he, so he's using his own fear and his own realization of his own body to amplify this character, which is actually giving Jesse a hell of a lot more levels than I would say some of the female characters we get in the rest of the Friday series. Absolutely. Simply because you've also got this idea of Freddy, the evil inside him wanting to use his body and those dream sequences for me i think are a lot better than a lot of the dream sequences even in the first one you know we start to get the little hints jesse waking up in the middle of the night going down the stairs and seeing 
you know, this horrible man pull a glove out of the boiler like we'd seen from the first movie. I love that sequence. He stops him in the stairs and he's like, you've got the body. I've got the brain. And he just peels the skin back. Oh my God, yeah. it's so great. You've got the body. I've got the brain. Now, this is like the theme of the film where Freddy wants Jesse to kill for him. Yes. But again, looking back at uh, looking back at this film now, we've seen Jason being manipulated by Freddy to kill for him. Yes. Anybody to kill for him to make people remember who Freddy Krueger is, that gets his energy back. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that's not quite the case in this part, whereas Freddy literally wants to inhabit and take over Jesse's body yes. as, as the film goes on. So there is that kind of body horror element. There is some great horror atmosphere moments but there is also quite a lot of you know meandering jesse wandering around the house in the middle of the night thundering lightning you know and, and there's lots of shots of just slowly walking around everywhere with very little payoff yeah well we're, i mean we've got to we've got to build the tension that's what yes, i yeah, find yeah. we can't just keep having freddy jumping out every five seconds because it, it it loses its touch you know we've got to really build it up when you, when you balance it with Kim Myers, played by Lisa Weber, now, I get the fact that she really, I mean, in hindsight, you know, if we could change it, she really should be the main character. You know, maybe she should have been the character moving into the house, and Jesse should have been the one trying to, you know, convince her that there's something wrong with the house. But Freddie possessing um, Lisa's body doesn't make any sense. You know, it, it, it's something that will never come up again in another film and it never happened in the first one. So it works for me. It works for him to possess Jesse's body. He, you know, Freddy is a disembodied spirit. If he can make Jesse scared enough, broken enough, he can just use his body as a doorway to get through and kill more and more children because that's all Freddy ever wants to do. Kill more children, be remembered. That's how he gets all of his power. And you're just constantly getting the little hints coming through. So like when Jesse's tidying his bedroom, you know, and they find uh, Nancy's diary, which she never wrote in at all in the first one. <laughs> well, it's funny because all the pages in this diary appear blank anyway. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I'm like, is it dream words they're reading? I don't know. <laughs> and, and and Lisa decides that, yes, yeah, she's going to use this now to, to uh, research into what's going on. Because from what I understand, like... These things only ever happened on Elm Street. Springwood's like a really big place. Like huge. Like fucking Lisa lives in the rich part. Well, I mean, yeah, she does. <laughs> with, a, with a fabulous pool party and everything. <laughs> yeah. Lovely father figure. <laughs> um, anyway, um, when they were making this film, they honestly thought that the house was more iconic than Freddy Krueger to begin <laughs> with. <laughs> yeah. They were like, it has to be in this house. It's got to be this house. Um, you know, and Freddie was just like, yeah, Freddie will be there, but it's going to be this house. <laughs> yeah. That's why there's loads of shots of this house in the middle of the night and the music going, dun, dun, dun. Right. <laughs> As we come in on this house, it's like, yeah. oh, it's the house. It's something horrible is happening in there. Amitville, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I get from that because the glove had always been left in the boiler that that really is the last remnants of his evil. Yeah. You know, if he can get somebody to get that, then they can start remembering him. And as soon as they get a tiny little hint of him he'll start to come back and he and he starts to you know like i said we're, we're we're getting these hints of like we see jesse turn up in his sister's bedroom and he's got the glove and he thinks he's gonna kill her and there he... was a couple of moments in this film that reminded me of the evil dead right right now, yeah we, we know in uh evil dead one there was the hills have eyes poster yes. and the nightmare on elm street they're watching evil dead one yeah in this one when the camera's in the basement yeah and it's like <laughs> yeah. as it's going up the stairs yeah. all the way up right into the girl's bedroom or, granted we get the silhouette of freddie or jesse but yeah uh, but then it was also it's the moment when jesse has the other nightmare right and he ends up wandering into a gay bar yeah Dressed in leather and spiky collars. I don't, I don't understand what the problem is. Marshall Bell was just doing his safeguarding job as a teacher and stopping an underage person having a drink in a bar. Ah. 
Oh, so we took him back to the gymnasium in the middle of the night to, to, to strip naked and shower. To 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 make sure that he was cleansed of his... I don't know. Like, no teacher should ever take a child back to a gym in the middle of the fucking night. No, no. I do want to point out a cameo here, though. It was Robert Shea is the bartender. <laughs> yeah. That's the dude that owns this entire franchise. Near yeah. enough, or did. Yeah. Um, he ends up taking Jesse back to the gym, makes him run a lap. Yeah. Then sends him to the shower before he ends up being attacked by lots of balls. <laughs> he gets so much balls to the face action. <laughs> uh, he ends up being tied up by skip ropes. Yeah. Dragged, dragged into the shower room with Jesse. Man, I've always thought Marshall Bell is such an amazing actor. He is. Like... So many Quarko, From Total Recall, Total yeah. Recall Starship, Starship Troopers. Troopers, fucking, you know, just he's so he's so good as just the background character. And like I said, when I watched this at a young age, this whole sequence of all the stuff attacking him, I kind of see as kind of so Jesse is kind of half asleep. You know, Freddy's in his body, Jesse's half asleep, and so Freddy is influencing the world and he wants to he wants to kill. So the closest person is the is the coach. So he beats him up with all this stuff, kind of poltergeist uh, style, you know. And then he drags him through there. And Marshall Bell's just screaming, "No, no, leave me alone!" And then the, we see the shower heads all pop off in the showers, and then steam fills the, fills the room, and we see Freddy step out of the steam. Now, ladies and gentlemen, from what I understand, that's not Robert England. It doesn't move like <laughs> him. If you take a still image, the makeup looks incomplete. It's like... <laughs> it's just a guy in a mask. Yeah. But I said this to Gary before we filmed as well. For me, for uh, Nightmare on Elm Street uh, Part 2 is one of possibly the last ones that we actually get some proper, proper gore. You know, yeah, you can remember all of the different kills that Freddy has done. But if you compare Tina... Dying in the first one with the claws going across our guts to, I don't know, uh, the, the guy in number three who gets tongued to a bed. Like, there's really no comparison when it comes to the level of gore. And it's the same with this one. We see Marshall Bell get pulled up, gets his clothes completely ripped off. And then you just see the claws just strike down his back and blood just kind of pull out. And you you know that, that not only did that fucking hurt, but he's fucking dead. You know, no no laugh. No funny one quote, you know, no one-liners, just simple slash slash dead. And Jesse stood there and he looks at his claw and he just lets out that horrible scream. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I'm having that nightmare. Best go to school today. <laughs> yeah. Oh, look, there's one ambulance, one police car. Oh, Coach Schrader's dead. And oh, they, well. they didn't even get the sheriff back. Like, like... Well, I'm guessing he left town with Nancy after the after the mother was killed. Well, this is it. Like, we're... they do explain that the mum did die in the living room of the house. Yeah, yeah. So, we're guessing, yeah, she got pulled through the window and killed. I mean, Nancy's story and her father's story will be expanded more in number three. But at this point, we didn't know. They just kind of, they just retconned it. Oh, yeah, they left. Yeah. They, they, they just went... Um, but yeah, so Grady starts to, you know, uh, you know, explain to Jesse about what happened. And then Lisa, who's still been investigating the, um, the, the diary, comes under the uh, information of Fred Krueger. And so she takes Jesse out to the abandoned steel mill. Um, and they, they have this kind of little kind of not really like a flashback thing. It's more like a, to see if Jesse's got any spiritual connection to anything here. You know, if there's anything that stands out to him. They see what a fridge. And they the get jump scared by a rat. Yeah, by a rat. Um, <laughs> and, it's, and it's all building up to Lisa's big party as well. She's going to throw this huge shindig at her. She really wants Jesse to come because she really does fancy him. She wants to build up on this relationship. But Jesse is literally just psychotically getting more and more broken and we have yeah we have the parakeet situation now at first i didn't fully understand what the fuck was going on but what i get get from the information from the movie is that kind of freddy's influence is heating up the house right yeah. we had the scene of, of like the records melting off the side yeah everyone's always well jesse's always waking up in a hot sweat yeah uh so yeah there's definitely that underlying thing that things are boiling under the surface yeah and and the front room is so hot and they throw a blanket over the top of the birds because the birds are to sleep um and then we see the it rattle and when they pull it up 
you know, people go, oh, well, it's Freddy possessing the bird. And I'm like, I don't see that. I see it as the bird was incredibly fucking hot <laughs> yeah. underneath that thing and just wanted to get out of its cage. So it kills the other bird and then it flies around the room, attacks the dad and bursts into flames. <laughs> I don't mean to laugh, but when all, the feathers, when all the feathers are just coming down. Man, if you can't laugh at a Clue Gallagher movie, you're, you're right. doing it wrong. Right, right. You know? But that's it. Like, Clue Gallagher's running around and he's just like, man, you try to explain to me why a parakeet would just fly around and explode and burst into flames. That's just not normal. Yeah, that's not it's normal. like, right. I mean, it's got to be a rational explanation. I mean, animals just don't explode into flames for no reason. Do they? That's right. Right. Uh, like the mom's like not too worried about Jesse. She's like he'll be fine. He'll yeah, be fine. Yeah, she's but, drunk. <laughs> but dad is just like he's on drugs. He's taking something. You know something yeah. is wrong with our boy. Middle of the night, the police turn up with Jesse. Like, hey, we found him wandering on the highway naked. Yeah. Is he yours? You might want to keep a tight leash on him. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mom's like, I'll just go to bed, dear. You'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, you'll go to bed. <laughs> But yeah, it's all building uh, to to this big uh, big party moment. Jesse, we see in the background, you know, he's dealing with what's going on in his life. Nobody's believing him yeah. that everything is going wrong in his life. He ends up sneaking off. Lisa follows him, and they kind of about to have a romantic moment mm. when Freddy makes his presence known again. <laughs> yeah, I love that tongue situation. <laughs> yeah. And so, of course, he ends up rejecting his girlfriend and going, no, I can't do this. It's not right. And runs off to his boyfriend. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, he, he he decides that there's something inside him so he can't be with the girl. So he's going to go. But he, like, he goes to Grady's house. Now, I don't see the gayness. He, he goes to Grady's house because Grady is his only friend. He hasn't really, Jesse hasn't built built up any other friendly relationships throughout the entire movie we don't know how long he's been going at this school only assume a couple of weeks so grady is probably the closest as a friend he can i mean i love robert rustler i love yeah. him in fucking vamp as aj he played he he doesn't come across as gay to me he comes across as like the straightest guy ever even when he is just blowing off some of the girls there's that cafeteria sequence where he's just like no i'm not going to the party i'm grounded it's like <laughs> Man, he's really just annoyed. But he sat there, was he? He's got his little, like, like his his silk sheets. I thought this was what all 80s bedrooms were supposed to be like. <laughs> the colours, the water beds and stuff like that. But this whole sequence I absolutely love. He um, Jesse says to Grady, look, I just need to get some sleep. Can you stay awake for me? And this is something that would later come up in other movies. And I think this is probably the first time. Or maybe they did it in the first movie as well. It just didn't work out as well. But Jesse falls asleep, and the moment that Grady falls asleep, I think that's where Freddy's now used Grady's nightmare to come into the world to possess Jesse's body. Because now we see Freddy utilizing Jesse's body, and it, it, I think it's a great change. Oh, absolutely. They brought in Kevin Yeager this time around yeah. to do the makeup effects on Freddy's face. Uh, they, there was a few actual changes to Freddy this time around. I think his it, eyes changed. They've changed his eyes. They gave him these lenses, yeah. which gave him a more demonic look. They also changed his sweater yeah. to have the stripes all the way down the sleeves now as well. Right. Ah. But of course, the, the hat and glove remained remained the same. Yeah. Uh, but Kevin Yeager decided, like, they didn't keep any blueprints or schematics for how they did Freddy in the first film. No, no. They thought it was one and done. And so he had to go and do his own research on burn victims and right. and how the skin is affected and tried to do a realistic burnt man face. It, it looks really good. In comparison now, to the later movies, this is really... I know, I know, I know. A, a lot of people really like Freddy 2's makeup. I, I, I personally don't. For me, it's the weakest. Really? Um, I prefer when we can see more defined features where the skin's tighter on his face because the skin in this one just feels really puffy especially around the lips you were, yeah and now yeah. i mean it, it it's still effective it's still quite disgusting and frightening yeah but it's not my preferred look of freddy even though this one's the most disfigured and horrific yeah uh, but yeah kevin yeager did some special some great special effects as well with the other special effects team to pull this transition effect off where yeah, you know, I will say the eyeball at the back of the throat. Yeah, yeah. You can see the cut out line. It's not quite right, but it's effective in what it's trying to do. It's 85. You know, they're trying to work it. Yeah, but the whole, you know, stomach protrusions, yes. the blade cutting open and Freddy's 
com- coming out of him yeah. uh, was 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 really well affected. I mean, we see uh, Mark Patton's like upper torso contorting. Yeah, yeah. Can, we know it's a dummy. Yeah, yeah. But it was still pretty lifelike, especially for '85. I, I love the fact as well that the the blades come through his hand. Yes, they extend through his fingers. Through his fingers instead of becoming a glove. And then that's what you'll see if you look carefully. Freddy's not actually wearing a glove. He's just got blades coming out of his fingers. And he comes up across Grady. Grady just cannot get out of his room. His, his mum and dad are on the other side. And it's, it's, all, it's almost up there along with Johnny Depp's death. You know, that the parents are right there and cannot do anything to save their child. And they just have to watch. And you just... Freddy picks up Grady, slams his claws into his gut, and then pulls them down the door. Ah, that is... That's a gory death. That is a gory death. Not... You know, just having fun. I and, and I know we have fun talking about the later movies of of, of See, for how me, that's not, die. It's a brutal kill, but gore for me is when in, the intestines spill out everywhere. You're, yeah, yeah, <laughs> but it's it's imaginative as well. It's it's how I would. Well, it's imagine also what's rare. I guess when you consider the entire franchise to watch Freddy kill somebody with the glove. Yes. He doesn't do it very often. No, he doesn't. <laughs> I mean, but the glove is always more of an extension of Freddy. Yeah. It just gives him that extra reach. Uh, and it also affects his posture. I don't know. It's, yeah, it's an extension of him. But to see him kill with a glove, it's, it's nice. really cool. And now somehow, you know, this, this takes Jesse then back back to, to to Lisa. Yeah. And he's explaining to her again, like, oh, I've killed Trader. I killed Grady. She's like, No, you didn't. Yeah, he's covered like, that blood. blood. <laughs> what do I have to do to convince you that it's Freddy Krueger? And she's like, Oh. But she she also knows as well that she knows that you know the idea that the fear. That Jesse is feeling towards Freddy is what's fueling Freddy. And the more Freddy is, the more Freddy is able to come into the real world. And so once again, Freddy starts to use Jesse's body and comes to the party. Um, <laughs> like, he he has this little moment with Lisa. But I, I, I do like Jesse fighting back. You know, telling Lisa that he loves her. That he, he, he can't, he can't, he's not strong enough to stop Freddy like that. But it does knock Freddy's confidence enough that Jesse is still influencing. And so even though Freddy's got the chance to kill Lisa the way the moment he has, he doesn't. He kind of just turns away and then he does that little jump through the window and, and just disappears. disappears. But then he catapults up out of the ground ah, to no. this pool party. It's... Now, you're either going to love this scene or you're going to hate this scene. I love it. I love I'm... It. Happily in the middle, actually. (laughs) Because there's three options. There is actually three options, yeah. I mean, yeah. But, like, for all intents and purposes, the horror of the moment is immediately stripped away. Like, Freddy Krueger out of the dream and in a pool party surrounded by kids doesn't have the same effect as Pinhead in the nightclub locking everybody in. Like, the kids are all running around screaming, but Freddy's kind of like, he's, he's fumbling around with deck chairs. Whoa, he's you know? having fun. He's feeding off all of their fear. Fucking yeah. Pinhead doesn't have to f- feed off now, fear. He just now, literally just stands there. I, I think it. maybe it could have worked, but I just, I just the way that it's filmed, the yeah. way that it's presented, like, it, it, it also breaks the rules. I mean, like, Wes Craven even said, like, when that moment in the film he got annoyed with. He was Why? Because like, it's broken the rules. What rule? Freddy Krueger in the dream. Freddy Krueger not in reality. So that that was the big thing. And that is what that is what divided everybody with this film. Wait, wait, wait. Was the extended Freddy possessing somebody out in the open. Wait, so where's Craven, who brought Freddy into the real world in the first movie, doesn't like Freddy coming into the real world in the second movie? Yeah. <laughs> but it's cause it's cause it's because it for what we're getting is it was it worth it? Yeah, well no, no no it's not. But we at least we got something. Like you said, the film was already marred with fucking problems right from the start. They already were having massive budget issues and people not wanting to move it. We're lucky we even got a Nightmare on Elm Street 2. But for what we got, I mean, I see the I see the 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 silver lining in it, you know. Freddy uses this to scare the teens. Yeah, he stabs another guy in the gut. People start boiling in the fucking uh, swimming pool because he heats up the water. You get that. I, I, I think it's iconic. You get that iconic shot of him stood in front of the fire telling them all that they're all his children now. And it's only stopped... 
because Lisa distracts Freddy because she still believes Jesse's inside there, which I still think is a really cool idea because it's the love idea that Lisa is trying to save her boyfriend. And then the father comes running along with a fucking shotgun, <laughs> you know, and just starts blasting up the goddamn place. And so Freddy just turns and just kind of gently walks off. Now, yes, I get the idea of why the fuck would Freddy just gently walk off. Jason wouldn't walk off. Jason would kill every single person there and just walk off. But Jason's not possessed. Jason's not got the spirit of a teenage boy inside him fighting him. We don't really see what's going on inside Jesse. Like, is he fighting like a spiritual version of Freddy inside him to try and keep hold of his body? You know, is it like the dream sequences from Freddy vs. Jason? I don't know. But Freddy walks off. But, uh, but Lisa knows where he's gone. He, she knows he's gone to the steel mill, and so she races off after there. The Rottweilers with the, <laughs> with the children's faces, I think, is a bit much for the movie. A bit much. I think it it's a bit much. It is perhaps one of the worst horror effects it's, I've ever seen. Still, I don't it's know. Still horrendously hilarious. The zombie people from Welcome to Raccoon City were pretty shit. This was worse. <sighs> this is still worse. This is this is hilarious. It's like, what were they thinking? They, 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 because, they wanted to scare a kid. They yeah, wanted to scare people. They, they had this whole elaborate setup for all of these demonic entities that were going to jump out on Lisa. But like, we see this rat that then gets mauled <laughs> by a cat <laughs> thing, which gets attacked by something else with lots of sharp, pointy teeth. No, I think that's the same cat. Oh, okay, right. <laughs> right. But uh, yeah, the budget here is clearly gone. The rush of production clearly yeah. caught up with them. Yeah, they had nothing, so they just pushed Freddy out now they, and, yeah. and have him melt and yeah and he by was, the power of love well that's it yeah the, the the thing that stops him is love she really loves jesse she wants him to fight and the the the, the, the place just sets on fire doesn't it well she's got to give she's got to make out with freddie as well give him a big old kiss on the lips that is pretty gross i gotta <laughs> admit that's one of the most horrific parts of the movie is Watching him melt or watching her kiss him? Watching him kiss him. Kiss was him. that Robert England or was that the Jesse actor at the time? I don't know. <laughs> I'm hoping it was Robert England. He's a god of. <laughs> but yeah, we watch him burn. We watch the body fall. And then Jesse, Jesse kind of climbs out of the remnants. You know, you, you you kind of left with the idea that maybe he's died within Freddy. But it's kind of like Ghostbusters. The body's been destroyed, but the spirit has actually managed to come out. And... I, I, the first time I watched this, I got to the ending and I was quite happy that Freddy had been defeated, but I was even more ecstatic with the way the film ended, knowing that the series was going to continue. Yeah, we get that idyllic, you know, sunny American family having breakfast. Yeah. Jesse off to school, yeah. meets up with his girlfriend on the bus, and off they go. Everybody's alive. Well, yeah, he's definitely got some, uh, you know, he's definitely haunted by his experience, because like, the bus driver, you're going too fast, you're going too fast, slow down. And it does, it picks up some more people onto <laughs> yeah. the bus. You're like, ah, oh, it's just a, a fake out. Or is it? Yeah. Because <laughs> just like the original Nightmare on Elm Street, Freddy takes over the bus once more and drives them off into the desert. And none of these characters are ever seen or heard from ever again. No. It's amazing. <laughs> so did Freddy kill them all? I think so. I fucking hope so. I, th I think so. I think he did. Because he'd, he, you know, all of the kids after the party would have been scared of him. He'd have been fueled with so much power. Like... After seeing the first one, I got the idea that they literally just stole the ending from the first one. Freddy had been defeated, yeah. but he's come back but again. Was this not scare. this entire ending after the, the factory when she's got Jesse back? Like, isn't all of this then just another nightmare? Because even the dialogue on the bus where she's like, hey, great party last night. I'm like, where well, all those yeah. kids got killed? Well, yeah, but that's what I'm saying. It's it's exactly the same as the ending from number one. Nancy walking out of her house and her mum like, oh, it's going to be sunny. And you're like, hang on a minute. Mum, you're dead. Yeah. This can't be, this can't be <laughs> It's right. going to be another dream. You know, and we see all of Nancy's friends. So as soon as I saw all in the second one, I was just like, yeah, Jess, Jesse's dead. This is Lisa's nightmare. She's going to get killed. All of her friends are dead. Freddy wins. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, Liam, what were your favourite scenes from Nightmare on Elm Street Part 2? I, uh, I had quite a few. I mean, I do really love the movie. I really love the opening sequence and going into the ending sequence with the demonic school bus. I think it was an amazing addition to uh, Freddy. And I wish they'd actually kept it up. I wish Freddy had had like, his own bus 
you know, coloured his own colours that he'd appear of now. I know it seems a bit cheesy, but hey, look where we go, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> um, I did, Like I said, I just really love the, the whole uh, opening sequence because it does set up this whole nightmare imagery that Freddy is there already. He's in the background. And even when we wake up and we hear Jesse screaming, it's the fact that I'm still looking like, oh, Robert England could be in the background at any point. Um, I really love uh, the, the coach's death. Um, but I, I love Grady's death even more. You know, there's not many deaths in this movie, really. The coach, Grady, a couple of kids at the party. That's really it. But Grady's alone, I think, is just the best one. Because the combination of the transformation of, of Freddy coming out of Jesse. And then the idea of the dad on the other side of the door. And then the claws just coming through and just going down. It's just... Oh, it's fucking scary. Um, I, I, I do kind of like the dance sequence. <laughs> Not that way. No, I just, I've, I've danced my own time. And when I put Nightmare on Elm Street Part 2 on, you know, I just know he's going to put those glasses on and he's going to pop that thing in the air. <laughs> yeah. Wait, you know, I have to ask you a question. Right? Yes. This film's called Freddy's Revenge. Yes. What was he revenging? Do you he, know? I, I, revenge of his defeat of the first one. Oh, okay. Kind of like Snake's Revenge on the on the uh, NES with Metal Gear Solid. This film doesn't actually make any connection to the actual storyline. <laughs> <Sure. laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got quite a few favourite scenes from the film as well. Uh, the school bus scene right at the start. I think it really sets the tone and the atmosphere uh, for the rest of the film. And also, I like the dream sequences in the entire yes, franchise. Yes. Uh, and this film is, I would say, much lighter on the the actual nightmares. Uh, portion of the film so these moments which are surreal and over the top I really liked the same as him walking through the house and walking into his sister's room and seeing her skipping mm. uh, before yeah. he uh, turns and walks but he just nopes right out of there <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> nope <laughs> I really liked the the sequence uh, before before Brady gets killed uh, Freddy basically cutting his way out of Jesse yes. yeah. I thought that was very very memorable uh, even at the time first watching this film even today I think the effect holds up pretty damn well I also just love some of the comedy moments in the film, like the parakeet exploding and the feathers coming down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The yeah. After, after the bus dream sequence at the beginning, the family just reacting to Jesse screaming upstairs. <laughs> like, they know this is a regular occurrence, but the reaction and the timing and the edit is, is really, really funny. Yeah. Uh, there's also a sequence later in the film as well, which I just thought was was really quite funny. Where again, family breakfast. Jesse comes down over to the counter. Her mum turns around and goes, "Oh, you're looking better today." And she, he just turns and looks at his mum like, "Fucking what?" She's drunk, <laughs> right? She's drunk. <laughs> Yeah, just some great little funny moments in there. Uh, but Mark Patton as well. His performance was was really really good. Well, Ian, do you recommend? Nightmare on Elm Street Part 2. Oh, hell yeah, I do. I personally think this is one of the top ones out uh, in the series. And I know that that kind of might be a, a bit blasphemous for people who worship the whole entire series. But you have to understand, this is the first one I ever watched. And I'm a sucker for fucking sequels. I just think they take the original idea and they elevate it far more to try and get a franchise rolling yeah i know when we get into number three that's where we get some of the real iconic freddy stuff the stuff that we really remember but we would never have had a number three if we hadn't had the success slash failure of number two i mean it what it was a three million budget but they made like 30 million back it, it so, made more than the first one so Fuck y'all for telling me that it's unsuccessful because people rush to see it. They might not have liked it. They might not have liked the undertones. It might have been successful, but the critical reception was mixed as well. Yes, but these are the same people that told me the thing was a bad movie. So I don't listen to that. I go and watch the movie. I see what's in it. I see some of the iconic stuff and I go, yeah, give me more. <laughs> I do recommend A Nightmare on Elm Street Part 2, though I have considered this the worst entry in the series. By Breaking the Rules Part 1, by being substandard in the horror, it was goofy and campy and it feels inferior to Part 1. But over the years, I've softened up on Part 2 and really <laughs> enjoyed the effort to try something new and yes. really 
I really enjoyed the performance of Mark Patton. He is fascinating to watch, really makes you care for the character, his vulnerability and complexity, and he really earned the title of first male Scream Queen. Yes. Great, memorable performance. Of course, Robert Englund also cemented that Freddy is not an extra in a horror mask. That personality really shines through, and his ownership of the role really bleeds through. Freddy is still totally frightening, but the fun Fred is having just dialed up yet again, just stopping before becoming really comical, which the series would follow. Yes. The film has some great atmosphere, freaky dream scenes, and of course the homoerotic subtext that hits the surface in mostly the right spot. The music was pretty good, but missing the theme of the original and the sequels, making this film feel like an outsider to the franchise, yeah. lacking that haunting melody. Kevin Yeager did a great job along with the effects team, and there are some great practical effects along with some cheap and rushed puppet animals, but it still works. The film, I believe, is slightly underrated, even by myself. It's the one I skip the most in reruns of the franchise, but still worth a watch. For the man of your dreams is back. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for watching Off The Shelf Reviews.